Hello everyone, um, thanks to Signify, to Signify for inviting me around. Um, my name is Andreas, I work for Property Partner. i um, been in the business of writing software for 17 years now, so um, Scala for the last five of it. I've run about common list before that, and then I think like everyone my age, it was C and C++ before that. So, coming around a bit. Um, I've come to London about five months ago, enjoying it so far, um, <coughs> hailing from Brisbane, Australia. So, let's get started. Um, my talk's going to be about uh, type classes, and um, you know, it, it's such a fundamental kind of concept um, in Scala, um, and you know, people don't necessarily talk about it much, but there's actually quite, you know, an interesting uh, history uh, about it, and um, so we're going to be looking at, at the history a little bit because it, it sheds light on um, why uh, the encoding in Scala is the way it is, um, which is a bit clunky, but um, it has historical reasons. Um, so let's just get, get straight, straight into it. Um, Wadler introduced um, in a proposal to the Haskell committee um, how to make ad hoc polymorphism less ad hoc. He um, suggested uh, what he called type classes then um, as a way of, of implementing ad hoc polymorphism, um, which basically, you know, ad hoc is no um, negative term, basically just means it's not an integral part of the type system, it's a way of doing functional overloading or method overloading. And um, basically means that you know you have a function defined over different types and it implements different behavior dependent on the types. And and this is a, a quite fundamental concept because you know as opposed to parametric polymorphism where you have the same functionality for all instances of your types, you um, can do things like, you know, um, uh, having, you know, you, you have an array and you have a function called the, like member. So this can't be applied to all types. You need a, a you know, way of comparing equality of, of types, for instance. So it's a very fundamental um, concept. And what I proposed, um, uh, introducing that to the Haskell language, that was actually pre-Haskell. And the way he um, proposed of doing that was <coughs> through dictionary parsing. In sort of OOO languages, um, Method overloading is implemented through, um, you know, you have a pointer to a dictionary that um, basically, depending on the type of your parameters, chooses one implementation over the other. And, um, you know, in the functional programming community, we usually strive to decomplex, you know, the object from, from the dictionary and, and we pull it apart and that's basically what he's done and um, sort of to show that, we'll, we'll derive um, how that dictionary passing is, is implemented. So basically, if you think of a, a type class, you know, called you know, numeric operations, ad addition and multiplication, you can define a dictionary that defines you know, addition and multiplication for your type A, and then you have instances for int, float, double, um, whatever. And then you can define your um, overloaded functions multiplication and square that use you know those dictionary functions explicitly from the dictionary that you passed in explicitly and um, if you think about this for a, a minute you know in Haskell that's all sort of um, implicit you don't see the dictionary passing happening um, in Scala it's actually implicit but explicit so you, you know in, in Scala you basically pass in that dictionary implicitly. And that's the encoding for type classes that we know and, and Budersky's sort of argumentation was exactly that. He said, you know, we can already do that. We have implicits, we have uh, object-oriented concepts, so the dictionary passing can just, you know, we, we can encode type classes by implicitly passing that explicit dictionary. So that's kind of why the encoding in Scala is the way it is. So let's talk superpowers. Um, what can we do with type classes? So like I said, function overloading um, is one way. Um, you might say that's a bit moot because you know, we, in Scala we have Java sort of type function overloading. 
So why would we need type classes um, for that? But I'll show that there's actually still a good point. We can do uh, return type polymorphism, I'll show that. Um, we have a sort of elegant solution to the expression problem. Um, I will show an example of that. Um, recently, type classes have been used to do type level computations. I don't know, is anyone using shapeless in any form or another in production? Yeah, okay, awesome. Um, so, you know, you, you can do type level computations with um, type classes, basically writing inductive proofs. Um, and we can also constrain our solution space. I will show an example um, of that. And we can also, you know, use it to, to use them to implement a limited form of dependent types, um, also as seen in, in shapeless. So let's get straight into that. Um, function overloading. So let's say we don't have type classes. We have Java-like function overloading. First three examples here, you have, you know, square for in, square for double. Um, it's nothing special there, but once you get into that squares function that gives you a tuple of three squares, you see that if you want to overload that favorite possible um, combination of your two types, you end up with eight squares functions, um, which is a bit, you know, um, you don't want to do that, right? So one way is using like your, your dictionary and um, you can do function overloading without having that exponential explosion of, of implementations for you. Types. Then I mentioned uh, return type polymorphism. Um, we can devise a type class or devise a function that so, so, uh, solely, but a re return type solely depends on the type of the passing function. Um, if we have a show 42 here, um, you know, uh, the, the only uh, type you're overloading show 42 over is the return type. Um, that val foo string equals show 42. Is that compiler, does it not? In Scala? It doesn't, unfortunately. In Haskell it does. Um, Scala's type inference is not powerful enough to deduce the type. So return type polymorphism, yes, but very limited, unfortunately. Um, constraining the, the design space. Um, Runa Bjarnason gave a talk at Scala World 2015 called Constraints Liber Liberate Liberties Constraint, or the other way around, can't quite remember, where he makes a good point about you know, how we can use our types to constrain the design space of our functions, but by that gaining reasoning power and, and um, uh, you know, the interpretability of, of our functions. So, if we look at this function, we map each element of the functor. Um, we get a functor of a monoid out of it. We um, uh, fold the, the um, we, we combine the monoid and we get our B. Um, what does that function do just by looking at the type, uh, type signature? What does that implement? It's straight out of the Scala um, standard library. It's fold map, right? You, you map over a structure and you set it. Um, solution to the expression problem. Um, by having type classes, we can, you know, we, we have our, our types, uh, algebraic types, we can easily um, extend our types and we can easily add new functions um, to our for our types, which is, um, you know, without recompiling the original source code, um, with the caveat that we can't have a steel trait there. Um, this is, uh, you know, try doing that in languages that don't have um, type classes, it's, it's a lot more difficult. Um, so this is a very elegant solution, um, in my opinion, to solving the expression problem. Um, Type level functions. So this function here, or this type class here, represents a type level function. It has zero value level effects. There's nothing going on on the value level. We're just working with types. Um, this is doing the Peano uh, arithmetic, like summing, summing to uh, natural numbers. 
Uh, it's defined as an inductive proof, so you know we have our base case and our recursive sum that you know basically counts up the b, counts down the a. If the a is zero, we turn the b. So just um, simple planar arithmetic. And by summoning the implicit at the bottom, we're actually asking the compiler to do that proof for us. Um, like I said, zero value level um, uh, representation purely happening at the type level. Um, this sort of stuff is used heavily in, in shapeless, pretty much you know, all the like page lists and, and co-products um, are defined inductively like that, um, operations on them. Some of them have value level effects, some of them don't. Um, this is basically copied straight out of shapeless, so it's in there. Um, like I said, a uh, combination of path dependent types, singleton types, type classes, give us a sort of um, you know, limited form of dependent types. And if you want to know more about that, I highly recommend browsing um, or using Shapeless uh, and talking to this guy. Um, adoption, I guess, you know, I'm, I'm just sort of listing the, the type level stack here. Um, it, I mean, the type classes are, <coughs> um, you know, Shapeless, like I said, um, CATS, Spire, Cersei, um, I think it's all fairly well known, and they all heavily rely on, on type classes. But, you know, there's, there's trolls, right? Um, there are issues. Um, there is compile time costs involved. Are there any Shapeless contributors here? No? Has anyone ever compiled Shapeless? <laughs> yeah. um, it is it is an exercise for your laptop. Um, there there is a slight runtime cost, but no one really talks about it much, so it's uh, negligible. Um, there is, in my opinion, a mental cost um, to it. I think it is fairly hard to grok, especially people new to Scala. You know, where do the implicit implicit instances come from? Um, it might seem like magic. It certainly was like that for me when I looked at Scala code for the first time. Um, and there is boilerplate. I mean, I, I gave a, a kind of, you know, uh, a rationale as to why the encoding is the way it is, but especially compared to Haskell, it's very robust. So, um, there are some more fundamental issues though, and I'll, I'll get into that. Um, one being orphan instances. Um, if you define your type class instances not in the companion object of your type class or the companion object of your type, um, you know, like in this object semi group instance, for instance, <coughs> it just lives here like in, in its own space. Uh, you're talking about orphan instances, and you know, this looks innocuous, right? Like you import a semi group instance, you have semi group append to matrix operations. That's fine. But then later down the road, you see this. and here you define matrix multiplication, which also is a semigroup instance. And simply by changing that import, um, you've violated referential transparency because <coughs> that code now does something completely different. So, you know, it, it might seem, you know, if you compare those two slides, you know, semigroup instance, semigroup instance to, you know, you might be able, able to pick that up. But in reality, you know, the header of your Scala file, there's like 40, 50 imports in there. Um, something like this is extremely easy to miss. Um, and yeah, you, you violate like a fundamental uh, concept of functional programming. Um, also, overlapping instances. Um, you can have something like this where you define a semigroup instance for a list of some type and a more specialized semigroup instance for a list of matrix 2D. And that might be completely fine because you know this is a more uh, optimized version of you know the uh, uh, append operation. Doesn't matter. Um, you can import both. And what will happen here? Does anyone know which one of the two instances will be used? The most sorry. First one. No, second one. The more specific one. So. You know, the way Scala resolves these conflicts is to choose the more specific um, implementation. So again, you know, your, your unit tests might pass, it, exact, it behaves exactly the same except for you using an unoptimized version 
which is something you might not want. Again, you know, this is easy to miss in a list of, you know, lots of imports. Um, they are subtle issues that you have to be aware about. Um, there are ways around this. You could do something like this, like, you know, provide an explicit wrapper um, to say you want to use one or the other, but it comes at the cost that now you have to explicitly wrap your type and unwrap it in the um, implementation of your, your type bus instance. So, with, like with so many things, um, there just is no free lunch, right? You either take the risk of having those overlapping instances, or you go the, all the way and um, wrap them, but it doesn't come for free. Um, let's get to the principal part of my um, a principal approach. So, um, type classes usually come with um, a set of laws, right? You have a functor type class um, that comes with laws. You have semigroup type class, which you know has to uh, obey the sensitivity laws. Um, usually, type classes come with laws, and if you don't have laws governing your type classes, you should probably think about you know whether there might be laws or whether you know using the type class is the right approach. Um, unfortunately, with laws, the compiler can't really help us, right? So we need to. Um, kind of write tests to to um, to test whether our type classes adhere to the laws we want them to adhere to, and you can use you know your property-based testing tool of your choice, Scala, Check. Um, can't think of another one, but you know define your laws, write your tests. Um, you can't prove that your laws hold, but you can be reasonable reasonably certain um, that they hold, you run your tests, you have 100 expectations here, um, you know, just make sure that you're testing your laws. Um, if you, you know, have, think of um, something like a, a, a type class called semigroup, you expect the append operation to be associative, you don't question that assumption when you're looking at code. If these laws don't hold, and, and there is a bug, they're extremely hard to find. I think it would be the last place to look into a semi-group append function, um, you know, to see whether the associativity law holds. You just assume that's true most of the time. So it's very important to make sure that the laws hold for your type classes. Um, another issue is, like I said, um, boilerplate uh, type classes are verbose in Scala. Um, there is a library called Simulacrum by Michael Tuquist, I think, um, which you know uses macro magic to do away with some of um, that boilerplate. So you can, you know, define your type class um, with the type class annotation, and it does, um, you know, provide all the, the boilerplate that I showed before automatically for you. Um, another thing is, and that brings us back to shapeless. Um, Automatic type class derivation for case classes and, and um, seal track families. Uh, if you think of you know a semigroup of vector two D, if you know that your ints like your, your two elements form a semigroup, it's a mechanical way of, of proving that you know your vector two D forms a semigroup. And um, this is exactly what Lars Hugel has done when he added um, the type class, type class to shapeless, where you basically define, inductively define um, type class derivations for, in this case, um, uh, some types, and, you know, by saying, you know, you, you have your, your head of your H-list and the tail of your H-list, and if both are semi-groups, then, you know, you basically recurse and you can get the semi-group instance for, for the sum. Um, right. So, principled, um, what does it mean? Avoid orphan instances if you can. Um, it's not always uh, possible, but you know, in large code bases, it's really hard um, to maintain, and they, they cause bugs that are really hard to spot. Um, property test your laws, um, scrap your boiler plate, and um, abstract over type classes. You can use shapeless or kittens, or I think, um, 
there's a sort of new player uh, by Echon Pretty, uh, Monolia, which does similar things, but at the macro level, so there's, there's less compile time um, overhead. You know, um, look into these libraries, use them, um, and yeah, any questions? Actually, no, sorry, we, we, we do that later.